you. Hi, I'm Pete Stevens from Mythic Beasts, and everybody knows there is no customer demand for IPv6. That's Sam. He's a customer. He wants some IPv6. Therefore, you can't see him. <laughs> so, we did v6 only quite a while ago uh, because I wanted to sell services that didn't require v4 addresses because I like money and I was going to run out of v4 addresses. So your quick recap is your VM or your Raspberry Pi only gets a public v6 address. It comes pre-configured with DNS 64 and NAT 64. There's a proxy on the network that will proxy inbound services that use HTTP or anything else using SSL. Someone always says, what about program uh, what about protocols that don't use SSL? Turn them off. Thank you. That was my TED talk. Anyway, um, yes, there's also an SSH port forward that works, but there's no CLATD. So if you try and ping 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, it says network unreachable. And all of our managed services that we use for managing things will talk over v6. So why bother? You can ask right for some v4 addresses, get back when they give you some. It's about 450 days since the last person got one, I think. So um, there's no customer demand. The customers know and un understand v4, and everyone knows they don't understand or want v6. But we already run a lot of managed v6 only applications, and now we're starting to do this with some bigger customer written applications. So risk-wise, this is a web service for property companies that manages risks. In particular, it manages the risk of you losing all of your money because someone dropped a concrete block on someone's head, and you didn't have a piece of paperwork that said they definitely passed the don't have a concrete block dropped on your head form. So um, yeah, compliance, that really, really exciting subject. Um, as a risk management company, they subscribe to move extremely slowly and do not break anything ever, which is different to some other companies' approaches to stuff. So this is the second one of their applications moving in. We did an internal application first, and it all sits v6 only. So it's a very traditional web stack. It's a MySQL database. It's got a bunch of file storage, memcached to make it actually work quick enough to use, PHP to draw some pretty web pages, Apache and a proxy service at the front to load balance everything around. So. Um, all the VM hosts run our standard cloud, except there's a magic thing that means you can put VMs on hardware that's dedicated to you. Uh, this means you don't get billed for spinning up VMs, which is something they like, because being risk averse, they don't like variable bills. Um, unless you need a chargeable v4 address, that's when you get an excess bill. So the tech team are incentivized not to allocate those because they cost money and involve purchase orders. Um, it gives you a couple of advantages over a general public cloud. So, you know, the next time Intel tell you there's a speculative execution bug and you can break out of your VM, since you own all the VMs on the hardware, you can delay the maintenance. So, in this case, only the firewall VM has an external link out, and there's a completely private network for everything else. So, Mythic Beast provides some central management facilities they want to use, security updates, backups, graphing, monitoring, and all of these are external to their application, so they are not on the inside of their firewall, so they have to punch their way in in order to access all the backend VMs. So this requires direct access. Our update server has to log in to apply updates. The backup process has to take lots of data out to our backup servers that you do not want to go through on that for 6.4 service. Um, we pull services directly for monitoring and graphing, and this is a lot easier if every single one of your servers has a globally unique identifier. And one of the real neat tricks is you could include with that identifier the routing information of exactly how to get to the thing you're trying to talk to. That's an idea that you could probably start a massively successful company on. So the firewall, there's a restrictive firewall at the front, and this is super easy to configure because you just have one line, which is the update server can do SSH, the graphing server can access the things it needs to graph, the monitoring server can access the things it needs to monitor. Um, and the other rule it has is the servers can send WireGuard packets to each other um, in order that they can pass encrypted traffic between themselves. Uh, Non-encrypted traffic, again, please stop doing that. So we don't have a public network and a private network. We've got a public network and an encrypted network. So um, every protected resource, the database, memcache, whatever, is bound to a, U, a, a ULA address, which is sat on the firewall. And um, every web server has a one-to-one -one tunnel to get to the database, and it's got a one-to-one -one tunnel to get to memcached. So you have an awful lot of WireGuard VMs that protects absolutely everything internally with encryption, even if the VMs are on the same physical host, because it's easier to configure the same thing everywhere than it is to make special cases. That's a lot of config, but someone invented Ansible, and it just writes it all for you. So that's great. Um, so we used to use 
SSL for kind of like databases talking to each other and web servers talking to databases, but um, setup and teardown of SSL can get a bit expensive in latency, and application SSL support is mostly rubbish. So, you know, they will do things like forget to check the certificate chain, uh, they don't enforce things, client certificates, what are they, how do you install them, is it in the config file? So, don't bother, just wire guard everything between and then your network layer is secure and you can just talk on encrypted between all the things that need to talk to each other. So, almost everything behind the firewall is v6. Uh, we don't trust the network at all, everything is SSL or WireGuard. The only v4 is a v4 address that goes to the load balancer that goes out to the very front end uh, because we need to run a specific load balancer for this customer because of tick box security reasons. Probably don't really need to, but we did anyway. Um, all outbound traffic starts as v6, and if it's going out to a v4 address, a HA proxy or NAT64 eventually does the translation for you. Um, this is where it gets more exciting. They use a service called Deploy HQ to deploy their updates, and this needs to SSH into all the web nodes in order to update the software on them. And because we've got full IVPv6 v6 support on Deploy HQ and on us, they can just log straight in with a single rule in the firewall that allows access through. So there's no port forwarding, your configuration is really, really simple, you just list all the servers and they can all log into each other. Um, at some point in the process of doing the migration, Deploy HQ's network dropped v6 support because they accidentally cocked up their routing. Um, SSH doesn't implement happy eyeballs, so Deploy HQ stopped being able to deploy to any dual stack host in a timely fashion. Uh, they fixed that really quickly. Um, so yes, uh, one against happy eyeballs here. Don't mask your v6 failures, then they all get fixed straight away. Um, obviously, we've no idea if they broke v4 support because we're not using it. They may, that may be broken right now. But um, but bugs, of course. You know, you move into v6 environment, you get some bugs. First one, our login form has rate limiting to stop people trying to brute force usernames and passwords. Uh, this was a varchar because that's what clever developers do. Um, it wasn't very big, so all the IPv6 addresses looked the same. Sky looks like one IP um, and so on. Uh, so overly broad lockout, we had to fix the software for that. Um, MySQL, we use that. We use global identifiers in order to do fast replication and failover between sites. That kept breaking. Turned out the queries just didn't work, nothing to do with IPv6 at all. Um, and then we also had a problem with lots of connections lingering uh, when you, you went there and basically your browser would keep running out of simultaneous connections to the same host. And that wasn't v6 either. That was because we got the wrong config in our HA proxy. So yeah, actually there weren't really any v6 bugs at all. It was dead easy. So. Um, that was that was that. That was my first, you know, really big production one that we've done recently. So now for something completely different. This is Sam. He doesn't build networks. Hi. Um, oh, bank slide. Another bank slide. Ah, yes. Here we go. Uh, maybe go back. Sorry, everybody. Anyway, I'll introduce myself. My name's Sam Pearson. I'm Site Reliability Engineer for an organization called My Society. Um, oh, first couple of slides are missing. So My Society, for those of you who've never heard of us, which is probably quite a lot of you, uh, is a charity. Um, we run a number of websites around democracy, transparency, accountability, and civic tech st type stuff. So they work for you. Uh, you can look at MPs records, Fix My Street, where you can report things to your local authorities, map it, where you can look up points and see what administrative areas they're in, stuff like that. Um, and what do they know, which is a big freedom of information web service. We serve millions of users every year, um, and we're, but um, we're quite small. Um, we're only 30 people. We have a small technical team with one full-time role dedicated to systems infrastructure, and that's me. Um, in total, we run approximately 30 production web services plus a number of internal staging and development systems. Um, oh, blank slide. <laughs> um, uh, regardless of the language, I think, I think some of my slides are a bit missing, so I'll have to try and remember exactly what I said, but nonetheless. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, our web services are written in quite a few different languages, and many of them have been around mm, for quite some time, since the mid-noughties, the early noughties in some cases. So some of the web services are PHP, Perl, Ruby on Rails, Python, Django, um, but regardless, hence this slide, of the language and framework, most of them are fairly organ uh, organized as fairly traditional three-tier web applications. 
boring maybe, but it works for us. Um, we've got Nginx and Varnish at the end of, edge of our network on dual stack systems. We run our own SMTP and DNS, obviously, at the edge of our network as well. Um, our application tier runs middleware process managers suitable for whichever framework is in use and are pretty horizontal, horizontally scalable. Nothing particularly dramatic. Um, our data tier includes Postgres, MySQL, Redis, and Zapien, which is a search index. Um, for systems management and monitoring, we use a combination of Puppet, Ansible, Isinger, Prometheus, and Grafana, so quite a lot of different things, but you know, um, various Perl and Python homebrew tools as well. Um, so before we, Pete said we were in demand for IPv6 only. So before we moved into the private cloud environment and Mythic Beast, we operated our services on a number of large dual stack physical machines that are another now defunct host UK hosting provider. We had uh, enough IPv4 addresses for everything to have a unique public IPv4 address. And we did not bother with an internal network at all. Um, so when the time came to move out of that network, um, we didn't want to replace everything with dual stack systems. And we didn't want to pay for lots of new IPv4 addresses because we couldn't port our existing ones out of our old hosting provider because they came as part of what we had with them. We also had a bit of a small presence in some of the big public clouds and platform of service providers, but we found that controlling cost was a bit of a challenge for us. Um, and well, we're small, we're a charity. Given time and resource constraints, refactor refactoring all of our applications to be microservices or more cloud native in, a, in an attempt to kind of chase cost savings just wasn't really a realistic option for us. We just didn't have the time resources to do that. And the opportunity cost was just too high for the, everything else that we wanted to do. Um, plus, we were a bit cautious about the risk of vendor lock-in, proliferation of infrastructure providers, more complexity of all of that sort of stuff. Um, but we did need more resources, flexibility for growth and redundancy, and we had to get out of our old provider. Um, so we already knew of Mythic Beasts. In fact, our organizations have some linked history many, many years ago. And so we were very interested in their private cloud offering. Um, they offered us a good balance between resources, costs, and flexibility, together with some pretty good technical skills. Um, but the private cloud assumes that the majority of your systems will be IPv6 only. So could we make this work? Because, um, well, A, we wanted to move there, and B, we didn't want to pay for loads of IPv4 addresses, or, and C, we didn't want to run our own um, internal network. So Mythic Beast ca take care of things like NAT64 as part of their private cloud platform, as Pete's already implied in the earlier slides, essentially making all of that stuff work transparently for our, from our perspective. All of the addresses are assigned as part of the cloud init build process when we provision VMs in, via their API. Um, so that's all nicely sorted. We don't need to care about configuring our network particularly. Um, we also had a head start that's been running fully dual stack for many years already. Um, we encrypt the majority of traffic between our systems anyway. Firewall have full firewall automation, so it actually ended up being fairly straightforward. Um, some fairly simple changes to just cater for systems without IPv4 addresses. Um, a number of our monitoring checks defaulted to IPv4, uh, but again, that was relatively simple to change due to the fact everything was already in code and automated reasonably well. Um, in fact, we have, in the end, we found only a single critical application, um, the Zapian Project's replication server that didn't support IPv6 at all. Um, and we didn't go down the WireGuard route that Pete used for his other client. We did use application level um, uh, uh, encryption. Um, but Nginx, TCP streaming proxy, bound to the IPv4 loopback interface on a server, meant that it, we could transparently encrypt the traffic as well, and nobody even notices. Um, so I estimate in, in the end that moving to support IPv6 only across our entire fleet was no more work than we'd need to say upgrade um, from a major operating system to another one in our core base server image, which we did actually at the same time as our migration into the private cloud. Um, so yeah, in the end, the biggest challenge wasn't supporting IPv6, but it was just the moving everything, um, which at the end of the day is true of any migration that you might want to do. Um, we got access to our new private cloud in early October 21. Um, we were deploying production services there by November. We completed the vast majority of the migrations and upgrades because we updated our base image from stretch to bullseye by July 22. Um, we currently operate approximately 60 VMs in two separate locations and are expanding into a third one of these, only seven, a dual stack. We've got plenty of capacity and redundancy. We can predict and manage our cost base more efficiently. 
moving away from IPv4 and private networking might seem like a huge project, but it doesn't have to be. You just need some good testing and automation and a good hosting provider. So Sam's sort of undersold how great my society is. So they built the first petition site for the Houses of Parliament and forced Gordon Brown to apologise to Alan Turing. Um, anyone heard about the Horizon Postmaster scandal where the Fujitsu system basically said everyone stole all the money? Yeah, that's like 700 miscarriages of conviction that they're responsible for. And slightly closer to home, someone used their, their what do they know to ask the BBC how they were going to deploy IPv6, and they were compelled to answer and publish it on the internet for us, which is really handy. So, however, it's not all that positive. Some external people want to firewall things to your IP address, and they want to know what it is. And of course, it's got four octets in it, because there aren't any other sources. So for NAT64, we sometimes have to originate all your traffic from the same v4 address, and we can't share. So per customer, NAT64. But that doesn't mean you need per customer DNS64. You can just configure lots and lots of blocks, and it spits out the right one. You just need the NAT64 one. Um, one thing we didn't realize, because we forgot to read RFC 6052 from 2010 when we first did this, is bit 64 to 71 of your prefix must be zero, and you cannot canonically put all of your NAT64 things in 64, 64, 64, 64, like we did, because when you upgrade bind, all of your traffic goes away. Don't do that, top tip. But other than that, that's the end. We have some customers for V6 only. Uh, we have a blog that you can follow. My society have a website. We're on this uh, Fediverse social network and uh, Facebook, which is a social network, and there's some other social network that thinks V6 is much harder than rocket science that you can also find us on. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Pete. <laughs> so before we take any questions for Pete, I'd also just like to, on behalf of the V6 Council, thank you again for hosting IPv6 Org UK, which is a really nice example of just what you were talking about. Our website is V6 only, essentially, and hosted at Mythic Beasts, and you can get to it over v4 if you really want to, um, thanks to the um, proxy that, that's there. Um, I just SSH into it if I need to via v6, because I have v6 at home, so there's no, no need to do anything else there. So that's, that's fantastic. Thank you.